Hi, everyone. Thank you for attending the Place Your Trades Network Spaces to discuss oil and gas markets. This Spaces is brought to you by Tradebate, which has a custom web app dedicated to trading CME Group's new daily option contracts, including indices, energy, metals, and now Bitcoin. You can trade these now on the DOM on Tradebate's main platform as well. They're a great way to get exposure to the futures market with limited risk. You can use the link in my Twitter stream to go get the Tradebate app for free. They also write a weekly blog and daily pre-market overview on the markets that you can subscribe to at placeyourtrades.com. It's absolutely free. And I will, I've been, I've started doing, and I will be doing a summary of this episode with my key takeaways that will be available to, as a download PDF on the Place Your Trades website. And so I'm going to post a link on my Twitter stream today where you can sign up and you can receive it as soon as possible. And with the formalities out of the way, I'll introduce our guests, which probably they don't need much introduction, but first we have Josh Young. Josh Young is CIO and founder of Bison Interest Energy Fund. Josh has built his career concentrating on deep value opportunities for investors. He has over 15 years of experience in investment management, 10 of which were focused on publicly traded oil and gas securities. Josh was a management consultant to Fortune 500 companies and private equity firms, and then an investment analyst at a private equity fund. He's worked in his, as an energy investment analyst for a multi-billion dollar single family office, which was nominated as Institutional Investor Single Family Office of the Year in 2008. He became, Josh became the chairman of the board of RMP Energy in 2008. 17, which was bought out at a premium in 2018. Next, we have Shabam Gar. Shabam is the CEO and founder of White Tundra Resources and White Tundra Investments. Utilizing his four plus years of experience, field experience across Alberta and Saskatchewan, Shabam launched White Tundra Resources in 2019 as a company for contact field production operations, production optimization, and engineering support. Along with this, he has also established his skill sets as a chemical and paraffin program specialist. Shabam is currently managing White Tundra Investments portfolio focused on undervalued Canadian oil and gas EMPs. White Tundra operates on a concentrated model with 15 to 30 percent of the portfolio invested in one leverage high torque equity, 40 to 60 on a basket of low cash flow generating equities and 15 to 50% on high potential small cap and junior companies with unique technology, excellent operational performance and strong management teams. Next we have Abdul Aziz. He's a prominent Saudi figure on energy and climate issues and a public speaker for major energy issues for the Chamber of Commerce commerce, municipalities, and other entities in the Middle East, a geophysical modeling specialist whose master's degree in geophysics, geophysics from KFUPM and higher education diploma in geophysics and oil business from the Institut Francais de Petrole. Uh, for the past 15 years, Abdul has been an avid observer in ENP activities in the MENA region. He reports daily on regional competitors' activities in the upstream sector, as well as reporting on quarterly updates on updated business activities globally in the region, including monitor monitoring of oil and gas discoveries in the Middle East, North Africa, and global frontier areas. And recently, he has joined Hill Tower Resources Advisor as senior analyst for oil and gas all right so well we're gonna start we're gonna start with uh we're gonna uh, we'll go in a round as usual i don't shabam you haven't been on my spaces before but um we'll go in a round and obviously if you have any comments to anybody else's comment please feel free to comment um because roundtable discussion is always nice but we'll start with abdul aziz given what has happened, what transpired over the weekend in Russia? Um, we had a conflict between the Wagner Group and Putin, and there was obviously a lot of fears about disruption of oil exports. Luckily, the situation came to a swift resolve. But can you kind of discuss the relationship between the government and the oil companies so people can kind of get a better understanding on this? 
Well, hi, Tracy. Hello, everyone. And such a delight to be with you and my esteemed colleagues, uh, Josh and uh, Shabam. Um, what happened over the weekend and what has been reported over the weekend had impacted the headlines, of course, but did it really make much of an effect on the oil and gas sector in Russia. The bigger question is how close is the oil and gas sector in Russia is to what government uh, daily activities, whether engagement in the uh, Russian-Ukrainian conflict or not, had, had been close or far from affecting one another. And what we've observed is the Russian supplies um, whether internally into uh, crude Russians into refineries or crude Russians exports, as well as refining product exports, have not been affected. Mainly because the relationship between the government or the Kremlin and the oil and gas sector is purely taxational. It's not really uh, more of a regulatory body, but instead it's a purely taxational where the relationship is mostly a, um, a quantity by quantity relationship. What I mean is every producer is being taxed on what they produce, as well as every refinery is being taxed by how much they actually export. Having said that, what we had observed over the past year, and if we reflect back on what happened over a year ago, we would notice that government did not really intervene much during the Russian-Ukrainian conflict on the oil and gas sector. As a matter of fact, many of the um, the oil and gas super international super majors have exited, but that did not really affect not the production of crude and not the operation of refineries. What? Well, if we connect the dots, we would come to uh, a couple of conclusions. We would notice that Russia crude exports had been increasing. Um, the Urals, for example, has been uh, almost averaging more than more than 2.5 million a day. And that's almost a 40-year high record for the Urals. What happened there? Uh, I would argue that having less government intervention actually incentivize the oil and gas sector as well as incentivize a better relationship between the sector, especially upstream, with the government. We realize that the uh, Russian government has been giving incentives for the producers and the refiners so that they don't really uh, slack back or hold on uh, while there is there is a conflict, but instead keep business as usual. Well, what we've observed, it's not been business as usual, it's business better than usual for the producers of oil and gas. Another aspect we would really have to realize is um, the variability. Russia does not offer only uh, crude, but it also offers crudes and products from various geographical locations. If we go over the list of where Russia actually exports from, well, if we if we go over the ports, it's the Black Sea ports, the Black the Baltic Sea port, uh, uh, ports, as well as the Gulf of Finland, the Arctic, the Asian the Vladivostok uh, ports, and these are major ports of high capacity. Uh, if we look at the pipelines, there is the Druzba, there is the uh, Skovorodino uh, pipeline, the, there is the Alashenkon. Uh, uh, pipeline as well as the BTC. So looking at the infrastructure of Russia, this is an infrastructure that is solid against many conditions, whether these headwinds that, that affect the exports or affect flows of, of, of crude and products coming into local markets of Russia. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll hold back here. Um, Maybe my colleagues would have something else to say, but uh, I'll be around. Well, I have one, I have another, one more question for you, but, but then we'll come back to you. But um, So we've kind of seen Russian seaborne shipments finally seem to be coming off that April peak. 
you know, after the cut announcements were made, the 500 barrel per day cuts, do you expect this to continue? I guess that, you know, there's lots of talk that Russia's flooding the market, but we are starting to see those come up. Do you think this, you know, do you think this trend continues? There are two elements for this. Number one, there is the 500,000 uh, cuts, voluntary OPEC cuts. And then there is the product uh, exports of the refineries that have been going through a massive uh, maintenance program. Um, I would also highlight that even during this this quite an overhaul of, of, of refinery maintenance, we've noticed that the, uh, the product market did not really drop much, which shows us how resilient the uh, Russian oil and gas uh, industry is to, to changes. And the bigger question we should ask is, how come Russia is so resilient? Well, that's the bigger question, and 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 the answer is, number one, um, there is a solid leadership in, in Russia. Number two, there is stability, stability in both the rules, uh, the rules and order of what happens, as well as the variability. Russia not only offers a massive is- infrastructure, but it it gives you this wide range of benchmarks that can be exported or used locally for refiners when the capacity allows for all these benchmarks to be processed. I mean, you're looking at Urals, Espo, the the Sakhalin basket, the so-called Sakhalin, the, the 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 Siberian Light, of course. There is, of course, the Varandi uh, uh, benchmark as well as the Arco. So uh, that gives a lot of flexibility. Um, yes, I agree. We might notice that there is less, but it's not necessarily because of operational or because of a, any restrictive uh, uh, interventions that have caused that. I would say it's the maintenance and the possibly the overall quota on the voluntary OPEC plus. Back to you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, now we'll move over to Josh. Hey, Josh, I don't know if you saw that. Uh, I recently posted a chart um, and I'll put it, um, I'll repost it, but basically it's showing analysts are most optimistic for Q3, the energy sector, by 64%, more than any other sector in terms of rating. So what are investors not seeing <laughs> right now that the analysts are seeing? Because so far they seem to be uninterested. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I would take the uh, the analyst uh, view with a little bit of a grain of salt. Um, we, we put out a, a, a white paper recently at Bison uh, thinking about different aspects of recession concerns. And you know, that's sort of been the pushback on the space over the last year or so is you know this concern that the US and Europe entered or would enter a recession. And so one of the things we looked at was what happens when the forward curve uh, for uh, oil uh, futures prices uh, differs from the spot price as well as differs from, um, as well as differs from analyst views and actually historically analyst views on oil prices. So on, on stocks, they tend to not be so great and often it's sort of noise, it's not good or bad. But on commodity prices, I can't remember where we saw this first. I think it might have been analysis from Goldman or it might have been from Ned Davis. I I can't remember exactly. But uh, the analysts are actually pretty good and they're much better at forecasting oil prices than the forward curve is. So I think, again, I don't know about the analysts' views on individual equities and sort of how meaningful that is. I, I would say it's just noise. But on the commodity itself, if the analysts are bullish, that's actually... Uh, you know, you're told you're supposed to be contrarian, but analysts historically have been better at picking commodity prices or at least commodity price direction on average over time than the forward curve. So I think I think that's sort of an important consideration. And then our, I guess, other thought is or my, my, one, one comment on on Russia and one comment on sort of short term oil prices. So 
from a Russia perspective, our theory is in terms of why Russian production has been resilient is that Russia actually had substantial production spare capacity that they weren't using ahead of their invasion of Ukraine. And so what we've seen is as service companies have left, they've, some of them have stayed, which is a deep embarrassment to them and shocking that regulators haven't gone after them for it. But um, you know, to the extent that there's less service capacity, it hasn't mattered as much because there's been um, this extra roughly million to two million barrels a day of spare capacity that Russia had to draw on. And I think over time, that ends up being a real factor as some of these more complicated fields that they were hoping to develop they have less availability of expertise and technology. They're going to have trouble accessing it, trouble bringing it on. It'll be more expensive and sort of less efficient, these, these newer fields that they're working on. And so um, their spare capacity, I think, has been uh, a real help for them. But it's also, I think, bullish sort of medium to longer term for oil prices because that spare capacity that people were counting on as demand has risen. And then just the last thing, on timing, you know, everyone's very impatient and it's really, really hard not to be owning public equities or owning futures with specific expiration dates. But I think it helps to step back and think about where we are uh, in terms of sentiment and the market and prices. And prices are pretty high considering how negative sentiment is when you look back over the past, let's say, five or seven years for the oil market. And so I think it's helpful to um, and, and, you know, I've been guilty of this, like sort of being too short term oriented and too focused on the weekly and monthly and whatever inventory data. But the reality is things are pretty good for the oil industry. And I would argue that they look even better going forward. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I think so as well. But and I was, the next thing I was going to ask you is kind of to walk through this white paper a little bit. Um, where, which is entitled recession fears mean opportunity in the oil market. So can you walk us just through a, like a couple of these, maybe a couple of these charts or a couple of, uh, you know, your, a couple of these things in your thought process? Yeah, absolutely. Here, I'm, I'm just pulling it up right now. So the first thing uh, from Brian uh, Feroldi is that just investor psychology is very, it's very tough. And this is tough for fund managers, it's tough for individual investors, it's tough for allocators. Oh, and by the way, none of this is a recommendation and none of this is a solicitation, um, just uh, as, a, as a heads up. So I think it's really hard to do well, and that's why on average people do poorly as investors. Again, professional, uh, individual, professional allocators, et cetera. And so, you know, this chart is just brilliant. Can't wait for a pullback as <laughs> stocks or prices or whatever are going up. And then it's too risky to invest now when things are going down. And it's just, it's just very, very hard uh, to buy when things are scary and then sell when things are exciting. Um, so I think that's sort of the most important from my perspective uh, is that's where I think being contrarian is really helpful is when you know, it's really scary to do something and it feels wrong, that's actually often the best time to go buy, especially a publicly traded security. And then when it feels wrong and feels hard to sell one uh, or to withdraw from a sector or whatever, that's actually often historically the best time to do it. So I think that's, it's just, I can't emphasize that enough. Um, okay, I'm seeing uh, the, the chart I was mentioning, the analyst expectations versus oil price movement. Uh, that was from Goldman Sachs. Uh, so I think that's uh, really helpful. And then uh, th this is on our website, just bisonandinterest.com, uh, or you can also, we, we start a sub stack just to be able to provide stuff for non-accredited investors, just for educational purposes. And so it's a bisonandinterest.substack.com. So yeah, I just too. tweeted out the paper if anybody wants to click okay. on it but right now. <laughs> That's great. Okay, cool. And then um, here, let's go through. Let me see one other one. Ah, okay. This Ned Davis one. I love this. Ned Davis is great. Um, they tweeted this, uh, and you know, I'd highly recommend following their uh, energy analysts and their and their account. Just really interesting, in depth. They're sort of the one of the leaders in sort of like quant uh, research, uh, leading to forecasting. And again, no one's perfect, and no one's right all the time, and so on. But they show that leading up to recessions historically, you've had significant moves up both in energy stocks and in oil prices. And you know, Goldman's talked about this too, and others have too, but I think it's really helpful to actually see the quantitative analysis of it. So the more worried you are about a recession coming to the extent that you don't think there is one already, the more bullish one should be, again, to the extent that history rhymes 
and doesn't even necessarily repeat itself. I mean, things look amazing leading up into a recession for oil as well as for energy stocks. And, you know, I think every time I see someone talking about recession, demand fears, et cetera, for oil, I think of this chart or other sort of similar analysis. And again, it's not perfect and it's possible that this time is different, but over the last many times, this has been the path. And frankly, we looked at prior recessions even before this, and uh, this chart actually maps pretty well for ones that are not included, uh, historical instances that are not included on this chart. So again, can't say enough good things about Ned Davis. Um, and this sort of analysis, I think, again, it's really helpful getting back to that first chart from uh, Brian, where it just shows the investor psychology. And I think actually doing the analysis and then being able to take a longer term approach is really helpful in doing things that are uncomfortable, like holding oil and gas stock positions or buying more of them as prices are falling and people get more and more negative and start you know, calling names and doing other sorts of uh, really sort of uh, unpleasant stuff. Excellent. Thank you. Um, we'll uh, go on to uh, Shabam. So what did I ask you? So recently we've seen a lot of oil and gas rigs come offline and frac, frac spread counts decline, are declining. We literally have burned through the 2020, you know, built up duck supply. And yet we're not seeing that much of a dent in shale production yet. Um, do you feel like we will be starting to see this soon or are seeing this um, maybe a little bit? And does this manifest at, at all in lower, lower production for, uh, for shale? Yeah, great question. I think one that's uh, on top of mind at the moment and, and one that I think we, we once again, I think need to take a step back on, on just looking at shale production. So, when we look at uh, what what did shale really do? So in 2018, uh, shale production grew 2 million barrels a day year over year. In 2019, it, it then again grew uh, over a million barrels a day year over year, despite the fact that 200 oil rigs were dropped uh, throughout the course of 2019. So, so this whole uh, capital discipline mantra and the PE, small companies getting bought out, it's a pre-COVID phenomenon. It's the reason why a lot of us were, were super excited coming into 2020 that maybe we might just see a change here uh, from a structural lower for longer cycle to now a higher for longer cycle. So uh, just, just taking that same mentality, we're now going to 2021 and 2022. And, and for shale to grow a million barrels per day in those two years, as you alluded to, it took, it took that rig count ramping up. It took the duck count getting absolutely exhausted from this, this massive high to at this point, uh, pretty much being a zero uh, excess DUC. The DUCs we see right now are are, are pretty much your, uh, what we'll call our working stock. So what the rigs are currently drilling, or they're on the same pad, or we have the dead DUCs, which are, let's say, pre-2019, uh, that are likely never going to be fracked because of structural problems in the well or some sort of other uh, issue there. So going forward, I think it's it's been really uh, interesting for me to see that the expectation has shifted from a million barrels per year growth to now wanting to see declines right away. And I think the market needs that. Yes, I, I agree with that. But we have to just realize how big of a step change that is. We're going from something that uh, even today, uh, uh, companies like Rystad and Inveris are coming out and saying shale's going to grow 500 to 700,000 barrels uh, per year for the next two, three, four years. Uh, and yet we're seeing the production pretty much flatline at this point for the last six to nine month period. And I do believe, yes, that declines are ahead, given the fact that the rig count uh, has now dropped that 75 to 100 rigs uh, over the last six months. Um, and I really think there's 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 two things here with the shale supply. The The one is the obviously the physical barrel on the market. So if you see a reduction in that physical barrel, uh, whether it's from a lack of growth or, uh, or a production stabilization or that production dropping, you see the supply demand picture continue to tighten, which in a structural supply market is really what we want to see. Uh, you also see that loss in inventory. So if we drop a couple hundred thousand barrels here today instead of six months from now, that ends up being that 40, 60 million barrels uh, over the course of the year that's going to show up in your U.S. commercial. So there's that aspect. And then the third aspect is really the psychological aspect. So uh, if we just look back at, at what happened in 2010 to 2014, uh, shale was still growing kind of slowly. 
Um, the commercial inventory in the U.S. was roughly flat, and yet the prices of oil were, were still sustaining $90 plus, and in some cases, uh, north of $100 a barrel. So we don't need to see uh, shale declines, nor do we need to see uh, multi-million barrel inventory draws in the U.S. to see that, that, that spike in price and a sustained uh, price staying there. We just need uh, some, some more market participants to believe that, okay, if prices go up another $10, $15, $20 a barrel, shale is not just going to ramp up another million barrels per day. And, and that still seems to be the prevailing narrative uh, among a lot of the analysts, among a lot of the speculators, and other people, even even people who are within the oil and gas industry and, and oil bulls uh, have this belief that, okay, when prices do hit $100, uh, shale can then actually grow a million barrels because they'll do X, Y, Z. They'll go into tier two, tier three. And, and I think that's where we, we're seeing a big uh, a change in uh, market opinion where, where I'm of the belief that, look, there's too many private equity companies that have gone bought out. There's not enough fresh virgin acreage out there for them to go and exploit. There's not enough growth-minded companies out there. The management incentives are not aligned for them to go and do this sort of growth, uh, nor is the availability of rigs there uh, to do that anyway, such that even higher prices is not going to bring on that new supply. And that really is the psychology shift we need uh, to bring speculators back in the market, to bring people back into this oil scarcity um, sort of environment, which 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 leads to higher prices um, going forward. So, yeah, there's a lot going on there, and and I think there's a lot of uh, information that uh, is out there, but is not really being properly analyzed or or input into the models. Uh, well, productivity being one of the big ones, uh, which I think. Uh, again, a lot of models are saying that well, productivity is going to stay flat or going to continue to increase when we see in companies that are suffering from inventory degradation, they see productivity loss every single year, uh, year after year after year. And you put that into a model and all of a sudden your 500,000 barrel per day growth becomes a, a, a zero growth or even further down. So um, yeah, I think the shale, the shale uh, declines are, are here now. And uh, we're going to see it really come to the limelight. Uh, but uh, along with the physical oil supply loss with that shale decline, we do need to see the psychology change. And I think what's going to make the psychology change really is the fact that if prices do rise uh, and when they when they do rise, the fact that shale will not grow at that prices, I think that's going to be the real kicker in the can and uh, and really change that mindset and bring that speculation back, which uh, leads to higher prices. And uh, that's, I think, what we're all betting on at this point. And then I kind of wanted to ask you, I see Eric's here, and I asked him the same question last week, but, you know, everybody seems to think that kind of recession fears are seem to be driving this market, but yet, you know, everybody's been waiting for this recession for, you know, a year and a half already, and it just hasn't come here. Um, so I, as far as, you know, looking at the data, you know, if we look at data such as mobility data and things of that nature, I mean, are we seeing that it really manifest in those areas? Like, are we seeing declines? Yeah, definitely the uh, uh, trillion dollar question, let's put it that way. So uh, once again, there's there's kind of two factors here to the recession uh, narrative. One one is, as you as you alluded to, is the actual physical supply loss or or demand loss. And that hasn't really manifested in the same way, given that you could have a recession. Uh, but just to give an example, something like a New York to London flight uh, this year, there's 60 to 80 percent more capacity on that route than even there was last year. So how does that make sense in a recession? So there's 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 a recession. But then we are still slowly waking up from this uh, uh, zombification we had during covid and then you've got the rest of the world slowly picking up. And there's always people in society who are just six months late or a year late. Uh, they, they maybe didn't want to pay the prices of last year when we saw gasoline and diesel and even jet fuel skyrocket. Uh, there wasn't the same, same kind of uh, plane uh, capacity to other parts of the world. And now with the U.S. dollar getting stronger, people are moving more vacationing to other parts of the world. Uh, we also see people moving from the goods part of the market to more of the services part of the market, uh, spending their money on experiences after they bought every single thing they wanted uh, in 2020 and 2021. So there's a lot of conflicting data out there. I think the main the main point we really need to stick to is that global demand looks really good. And a lot of the 
employment numbers look really good. A lot of the uh, retail spending numbers look really good. And, and there's this, oh, it's coming, it's coming. It's going to be this lag effect. And uh, yeah, maybe there is a lag effect, but uh, what's going to happen when that recession kind of hits? Well, the Fed's going to now go and cut and you're going to see uh, a more stimulus back into the market. So, so the narrative that the global economy is just going to crash and the world is going to keep it, keep the world at a 5% interest rate is, is just such a weird uh, way to look at it. It's, it's going to work the exact opposite uh, as it did over the last uh, 12 to 14 months, let's say. Uh, and we're going to see that, that demand continue up. And um, yeah, that's, that's essentially where we are now. And then uh, to come back to the second factor, there's, there's once again a psychological factor here. When you keep telling people there's a recession coming, they do tighten their spending just that tiny bit and maybe they don't buy that new vehicle or they don't go on that vacation with their kids that they were looking for. Uh, but once they keep hearing that, that for six months and 12 months and 18 months, they eventually get sick of it and, and, and they just have to go and spend that money. Um, you know, I'm not a housing expert, but the same reason possibly why you're seeing some of the housing numbers now tick up, uh, despite the fact that mortgage rates are at whatever a multi-decade high, it's just people get sick of that and they just adjust to a new normal. They adjust to higher gasoline prices. They adjust to higher uh, a chance of a recession and, and they see jobs out there. They see, okay, well, if I need to make more money, I can make more money. So uh, overall, yeah, will the recession hit at some point? Possibly will, will oil prices being higher be the uh, catalyst for that recession? Possibly. Uh, but right now from a barrel counting perspective and from even a future barrel counting perspective, things look, things look quite good. Uh, and really the, the main thing that I like to, uh, say is that in a structural bull market, you can't solve it with, with a temporary demand loss. You got to solve it with more supply coming online and more stable, uh, uh, low decline supply coming online, which just is not happening at this point. Um, and, and I feel very comfortable investing in that sort of thesis, uh, given where we are. And the fact that the lower we go here and the longer we've stayed, we've further affected investment uh, in discoveries and exploration, in more FIDs on any sort of offshore platforms, on on sh uh, shale obviously looks to be rolling over. So the supply side is not looking any better. And how long is, is a recession going to go on for? Maybe six months, maybe a year, maybe two. Uh, the world governments are, uh, usually do not fare well if their if their uh, countries are in recessions for multi year periods. And the, uh, uh, what they like to do best is to get reelected. So they will find a way uh, to get this 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 short term demand loss fixed and we'll be well on our way which which really is at the crux of the thesis the the structural bull thesis has not changed for three years at this point and maybe even longer when you look at some of us that have been that have been investing in that thesis uh over even during the time that shale was, was uh, continuing to continuing to grow um from 2016 20, uh, 17 and 18 onwards oh excellent excellent points Thank you. Um, we'll go back to Abdul Aziz now. I kind of wanted to talk about, um, so talk about OPEC here just for a, a little bit. So OPEC's always stated that their mission was oil market stability and they do not target a certain price. That said, there are a lot of GCC nations that have high fiscal break evens this year due to big domestic projects in the works. Um, and then we also did have the Saudi oil minister send a warning to short oil spe uh, speculators back in April. This kind of seems at odds with uh, OPEC's mission statement. So um, what does this mean and kind of what do you think are comfortable price levels for these nations? Great question. I don't think the mission statement of OPEC is any different. What is different is actually what Shabam just just uh, uh, highlighted in regards to how inflation is here to stay, especially in the West. Um, there are also other other uh, narratives or other elements of that narrative that is central banks whether it's the 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 feds or the european central bank they've started this this rate hikes for one mission and that is to control inflation but currently central banks are not fighting inflation only they're fighting inflation they're fighting a coming recession 
And believe it or not, they're also fighting higher oil prices. Higher oil prices as a, a result of restricted uh, supplies uh, that is uh, uh, that is caused by mainly new policies of uh, what is called a, uh, a, uh, a, a an energy mix shift or a transition. Call it what you like, but it's not really coming up, co uh, coming together as as one piece. Instead. Uh, it's it's becoming restrictive of oil supply and not really much on the renewables that are substituting and displacing other uh, fossil fuel sources. That's why there is also a, a, a cognitive in the market that central banks are only loading more problems to solve instead of solving what they started out with and handling inflation. Having said that, we would have to also realize that growth in the global uh, in the uh, global economy would only come from Asia, China, India, uh, Southeast Asia. That's where growth is coming from. Europe is going through a massive move of deindustrialization. It's actually a service-oriented economy when manufacturing is coming to a halt. I would also argue that GDP in Europe will become more difficult with time as rate hikes are also elevated. To, to also highlight what is happening with the shale producers, this only supports the, the current narrative only supports what we've been saying for the past four or five years that much of this shale revolution was fundamentally based on free money, uh, low interest rate, zero interest rate. But now the interest rate regime is changing. It's also changing the industry because that's what the industry was actually based on to start with. And having these shifts all at the same time, we do expect shale production to be more and more um, uh, affected by, by the central bank handling of the monetary policies. I would also like to highlight, I remember, um, was it in January or February, Tracy? It was a space with you that have highlighted that 2022 has been a year where government intervention has been at its highest. We've seen price caps, we've seen restriction of the global financial system, we've seen usage of, of uh, strategic reserves, we've seen all sorts of government interventions. Um, even though in 2022, we've had more supply to the oil market than in 2023, but the price was triple digits. That sounds bizarre, but it can only be explained that the more government intervention you have, the less the consumer is served. And so that also impacts the fundamentals of oil market when the oil market is left for market forces to dictate where the price is going, that's the only way where the consumer is served better. Back to you. Oh, I definitely agree with that. <laughs> um, and then kind of give us an idea. We, we have these voluntary cuts coming online. So what does the oil market deficit look like heading into... Uh, the second half of this year, particularly with these uh, voluntary cuts? Well, it really depends on how the recession would hit or how long it would stay that we expect a deficit. And to handle deficit, do we wait until the deficit is here or do we actually um, kind of work our way to go along with uh, demand as it drops. Uh, that's a hard game to play. But what, what we also realize is we do expect a, 
possibly a 1.7 million barrels a day of deficit to be towards the fourth quarter of this year. But hopefully, if a recession is handled in a better way, then in quarter two of 2024, um, we would possibly go back to a more balanced uh, oil market in supply and demand. Excellent. Thank you. Um, now back to Josh. We'll go back to kind of back to North America a little bit here. Um, so, um, you know, well, I'm going to ask you an ES, the, ES, the ESG question. <laughs> I'll wait for that one first. Uh, kind of want to look at. So, you know, what are some things that you think investors should in this sector should be concentrating right on right now, meaning, you know, it, whether that services, EMP, so kind of the, the subsectors of the energy industry um, that you think are the most interesting right now and that, you know, uh, perhaps investors should be taking a closer look at now that we've kind of had, um, you know, kind of, kind of a big pullback in some of these equities. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's a really good question. It's sort of the, the constant puzzle of the market is what will do well next. Uh, I think, you know, I, I have no idea what will do well or better in the next week, month, or maybe even year. But one thing I've observed that's, that's a, a pretty interesting and growing disconnect is that there are companies that are on major indexes and ETFs. So here in the U.S., you look at the companies that are in XLE, which is sort of the it's S&P 500 energy uh, ETF and index. And then you look at XOP, which is uh, the next size level down, but still, you know, large independence and a pretty actively traded and pretty large ETF and index. And if you look at the performance of those companies um, over the last number of years versus the performance of the smaller cap companies that are either in a smaller cap ETF like PSEE or are just not in one of these major indexes, um, the performance between the two um, is staggering. I mean, it's just incredible how different a smaller cap company has performed to the downside versus some of the larger cap companies, even though in many cases they're actually doing the same thing. And in some cases they're in the same fields and the same wells. Um, so in some cases there's really extreme uh, differentiation. And so I spend almost all of my time in the companies that aren't in any index or in um, just these sort of smallest indexes and ETFs that aren't really seeing much uh, from, in terms of fund flows because in theory over time, and, and this has happened in past cycles, it hasn't gotten quite as extreme, but you know, in the 50s and 60s, there were the nifty 50, um, there were other sort of trends like this in the past where, where money is concentrated into large cap stocks and into large cap funds. And uh, getting to participate where most other professional fund managers can't either because the stocks are too volatile or because they're not large enough uh, and uh, getting to buy stuff where they're not getting bid up by sort of blind fund flows into the S&P 500 um, or into other sort of similar indexes, I think is a really big advantage. And I think it's a huge advantage, particularly for you know retail investors who really aren't married to it. So I think it's less about oil field services versus uh, producers. I guess <laughs> I will say I don't love refiners. Um, and, and also, you know, I think midstream companies are very complicated. There are some that may do very well from some of the trends that Shubham was talking about, and some that do, may do very poorly, depending on what the growth trajectory is of the production in the particular areas that they serve. And refiners also, there's just been a, a tremendous expansion in global refining capacity. And it's, that's actually been one of the biggest disconnects and sort of interesting to see. The bearish argument for oil coming into this year was that there was not enough demand. And the bullish argument was that demand was going to rise. And I think there was some consensus that there was going to be constrained supply. <laughs> I think everyone's been wrong because demand's been great. Uh, there's been more supply, I think, than, than you could see almost anyone forecasting except in the U.S. and except with shale. Um, but international supply has been quite surprisingly strong in Russia and from Iran and elsewhere. And so uh, the, the weird thing is here you have crack spreads really high, even though you have multiple large refineries coming on or coming back from maintenance. And so uh, I find refiners to be sort of the least promising just because the trend 
likely for crack spreads is down, but that's relevant because crack spreads are wide right now, which tells you that demand is very strong. And even though price is down, it doesn't mean that the bearish argument around demand is right. Uh, high crack spreads mean that demand is actually quite strong. It's, it's a, a different issue in the market that's been affecting price. And then, of course, then I have this, you know, what are your thoughts? I know that you tend to lean towards sort of the smaller cap stocks, as you just said. Um, but what are your opinions on, say, the U.S. versus Canada? Oh, man. OK, so uh, I think I think Canada is I think so for most of I've run Bison for eight years. And for most of that eight years, Canada was very contrarian and especially small caps in Canada were very, very mispriced. And I still think that Canadian small caps are mispriced, but it appears that there's been significant fund flows towards Canada over the last, let's say, couple of years. And there's very obviously way more interest. I mean, you tell people that you were investing in Canadian publicly traded EMPs four or five years ago, and they would laugh you out of the room. Um, now they say, I mean, they might laugh at you for owning oil and gas stocks in general, but it's sort of considered more of an accepted thing. I've gotten more and more questions about it. Um, and again, you can just sort of see the, the trend in valuations. TD and others do these cross-border idea trackers and, or, or uh, stock trackers. And, uh, you know, valuations have converged to some extent. Um, you know, I just don't think it's off the run as much as it was before. And sort of weirdly, some of the small cap U.S. stocks have actually traded down to the point where they're as cheap or cheaper than some of the small cap Canadians, which it seems like a mispricing to me because, you know, you can love a, a country or hate a country or love the specific local prospects or hate them. But when you're in a country like the U.S. and you're listed on a U.S. exchange, you actually have the potential to end up getting bought or being included in sort of a bigger exchange with deeper capital markets. So sort of the, the logical uh, eventuality is ending up when you have more liquidity in a deeper market, getting to sort of a more efficient pricing, whereas Frontier and secondary markets end up with less efficient pricing. And so I actually am finding more, the sort of long answer, I'm finding more opportunities right now on the U.S. side and sort of surprising mispricings on the smaller cap U.S. versus what I've seen on a relative basis over the last eight years. Excellent. Thank you. And then, well, okay, I just have to, I have to throw the ESG in question really fast. So it kind of seems like the ESG is tending that kind of that ESG trend is beginning to wane a bit. We had, you know, Larry Fink just came out, said the narratives become ugly. And Vanguard left net zero banking alliance, net zero alliance, insurance alliance has all but disbanded, basically. So um, do you think people are finally waking up? And is it too late to kind of avoid an energy crisis? Well, we, we had an energy crisis last year and uh, Europe got really lucky that it was so warm this past winter and, you know, also lucky that China was locked down for a large part of last year and didn't need some of the LNG that they were able to redirect over to Europe. So um, <laughs> we certainly can't avoid an energy crisis because we had one. We may still be in one. Uh, this coming winter is going to be really tough. Uh, the German economy, it's sort of bizarre how they've been willing to accept a drop of, I think it's over 20% in industrial natural gas consumption. And a lot of that's actually reflective of lower industrial activity, even though they're an industrial oriented economy. So I don't think what they've done is sustainable. So I'd say we're still sort of in an energy crisis. And one aspect of that is sort of lower energy consumption and dramatically lower economic activity. So not great. And, uh, and that's you know, the direct effect of sort of poor European energy policies, which are continuing. Um, in the US, one really interesting thing, when you look at the, the rig counts, um, the rig count on US private oil and gas companies, mostly owned by private equity funds and funded by those, um, the rig count had actually soared uh, over the two years from 2020 to 2022. Um, and you saw a substantial amount of incremental oil and gas production here in the U.S. and shale because of that influx of essentially private equity capital, private debt capital. Um, that rig count's fallen a lot, uh, partly because of inventory issues, partly because there's just not that much capital remaining and not that much capital available. And so I think we're going to see 
uh, some of the effects of the withdrawal of institutions from investment in oil and gas. Uh, I think it's, it's sort of been delayed and lagged and there were some old fund commitments that were drawn on. There was some reinvestment that happened. And I think maybe just now we're starting to see the impact and that impact may be magnified because those were the incremental rigs and that was the incremental production. And so if you see 50 or 100 rigs less on the private side, that's directly, that's institutional capital that's not being invested into the ground, which is leading to production that's not showing up. And again, we're just starting to see that, but generally there's about a six month lag between rig activity for shale and uh, an effect on production. And then also the duck count is down a lot. So there's fewer drilled uncompleted wells for companies to go and just complete and turn on. And so there's, it's gonna take even more capital to get the same amount of incremental production. So I think we're just starting to see that. And I think it could have a material impact on global oil markets because there isn't really a next place to go for incremental supply six months from now, maybe six years from now, but six months from now, there's not really a great place to go to get the supply you would have gotten from those 50 to 100 rigs that aren't on because the endowments and pension funds and so on aren't investing right now in those uh, in the drilling of those wells. All good points, all good points. Um, Shabam, back to you. So well, we know that um, we know that you're an oil bull, but if, do you want to kind of just kind of maybe highlight the big reasons why? And then we'll kind of go into how you analyze companies to invest. Yeah, you bet. I think I think the re the really main uh, uh, thing being an oil bull is the structural supply thesis. So so demand for the most part, when you look at global demand uh, of world oil demand for the last 40, 50, 60, 100 years uh, has been on this trajectory where it grows one to two percent a year. And when we saw the recession, like we did in 08, yes, we have the uh, 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 lower demand for a very short period of time. But then demand doesn't just come back on its on its previous growth path. It actually goes in, and over a period of three to five to seven years, it will make up for the lost demand growth during that period of time. So we now are at 2022, and and I saw something this morning that said, well, we we might have suffered a permanent demand loss uh, worldwide because of COVID, but hey, we're, we still have not fully reopened. A, a large part of Asia, uh, as Abdulaziz mentioned, is, is that's where we're looking for, for the world demand growth going forward. And a large part there is still reopening. There's still flights coming online that have been shut down since February 2020. So uh, there is still that incremental growth coming in. Uh, and we also see that, that when we had a cycle like we did from 2000 to 07, uh, we saw China really taking the forefront and growing their demand at very, very high levels with their big population and their uh, aggressive growth cycles. And now we've got three times the population in that exact same part of the S-curve. You've got uh, India, you've got Nigeria, you've got Vietnam, you've got the Philippines, uh, all these very, very highly populated countries. They're all looking for the same thing. And guess what? This time around, they have access to the Internet. They They've traveled around to the different areas. They know what they want. They they want that convenience. They want that ease of 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 life. They want the petroleum products uh, that the Western developed world has. So there's going to be a accelerated demand uh, pull from the Asian market that I think is just it's just irrelevant of price. When you look at something like a farmer in India converting their their farm from manual labor to buying a tractor. Um, they are maybe taking over 20, 30, 40 laborers with that one tractor. So, so they're really price indifferent in terms of getting that, that uh, petroleum product uh, uh, usage. And once they get there, they're not going to go back just because it's so much more efficient. They can run bigger farms. They can, they can just do a lot more with it. So there's this permanent uh, demand that's going to uh, keep getting added. At the same time, we haven't invested in supply. I think this is a pretty well-known uh, phenomenon at this point. Shale came in. It screwed up the conventional oil cycle. Nobody really invested other than the fields uh, that came online in 16, 17, 18. Uh, but those fields came online because the investment decisions were made five years before that. So we're talking about the oil sands. Uh, we're talking about some fields in Iraq where you look at Kashagan in, in, in Kazakhstan. These fields have a three to five to seven year cycle by the time they come online uh, after the decision to invest has been made. So now those decisions have not been made. 
uh, in 2018, 19, 20, 21. And so as soon as that decision is made, there's still a lag effect to that uh, by the time that comes online. And and really, that's that's a structure uh, a cycle here that I feel very comfortable investing in. You see supply is not there. It, it can't even come online at higher prices because there's a lag effect to it. And we don't have the same sort of discoveries that we did even 5, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, on the demand side, we're looking quite good. Uh, even so far, as Josh mentioned, the crack spreads are are another factor that kind of show you that going forward. And then the inventories, we've really blown through a lot of the excess inventory we had, the the SPR inventory, a lot of the floating storage worldwide, stuff that was built up over the last five years uh, has been blown through. And so we sit here with uh, very little uh, bullets in the chamber per se, that if prices do rise, well, what's going to respond? Over the past five to seven years, it's been shale, which has come to the scene and really taken over. Uh, for the next five to seven years, there's there's really not much here left. Uh, and you see what's, what type of Herculean effort it took last year uh, to bring prices down from that $120 a barrel. It took, it took the release of the SPR. It took a Fed that was just going crazy. Uh, it took this recession narrative that came online. It took supply worldwide coming online, uh, a massive increase in the U.S. rig count. So there's a lot that happened last year to bring this price down. And, and the next time we get there, we don't have that bullet in the chamber. So... Uh, I think that's the simplest way to to look at the the um, oil environment we're in. And at the same time, um, and maybe we'll get to this, is companies are trading at the most distressed valuations when the uh, cycle is the most obvious, in my opinion. And I think part of that obviousness comes from the from the geologic side of things is that we just don't have those fields anymore. We've 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 blown through a lot of our conventional oil fields. We've we've gone through a lot of our uh, continental shelf fields. We've gone through a lot of the shallow water fields. Uh, some of the enhanced oil recovery projects in, in, in North America have now gone such that fields are at 40 to 60% recovery factors. So you're really going against uh, 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 diminishing returns here on everything else being being done. So so what's it going to take? Well, it's going to take deep water and it's going to take more exploration onshore or more enhanced oil recovery, all of which doesn't work until 70 80 $90 a barrel and even if it does work, now there's that lag effect and we're back in this in the same sort of circular argument where, OK, well, you might find supply five to seven years down the road at one hundred dollars a barrel. And in that meantime, we're going to make so much money that it really doesn't even matter uh, at that point in time. And if demand continues to grow, well, maybe we need to find more and more and more oil uh, going forward either way. Excellent. And now kind of. Let's talk about a little bit about, you know, kind of what kind of the same question that I just asked Josh is kind of what are the what are the some of the, the things that you really focus on or analyze when you're looking at companies to invest in this sector um, that are things, you know, specific to the industry and then, you know, which do you prefer small versus mid versus large cap, et cetera. Yeah, so there's there's kind of a financial aspect to this. I I do like companies that are trading at relative valuation, uh, relatively distressed valuations to their peers, and and usually you find that in your small to mid cap, uh, slightly financially leveraged equities. So uh, something in the five hundred million to uh, one billion dollar range would be kind of your small to mid cap, uh, and then if it has debt on it, I I really am a big fan of that. Uh, you know, some of us have gotten. Uh, shellacked over the last few years with with companies uh, trading at very very low equity prices, uh, but really the the debt profiles that these companies run on today uh, and are supposedly high risk uh, in quotation marks to the general investor are really low risk companies. You look ten years ago and companies were running two three four times uh, debt to cash flow multiples. Now you got a company running 0.6, uh, and suddenly it's it's one of the highest uh, financially leveraged companies out there. So. With companies in that situation, if they don't have a bank debt, if they have this this term debt structure that's termed out many years, uh, I think it's a relatively safe place to be uh, in today's market. Uh, if we don't see oil going down, you know, below sixty or fifty dollars for an extended period of time, uh, which obviously I don't. So, so that's the financial aspect, and then on the on the uh, engineering aspect, uh, I'm a big fan of companies that are that are small and growing and have that enhanced oil recovery opportunity. So there's been many, many technologies that have come online in the last five to seven years uh, in terms of geo steering, in terms of fracking, uh, water flooding, polymer, CO2, that really 
these small cap companies couldn't implement because they just never had the cash flow. They never had the capital uh, uh, support like some of the bigger companies did. And these assets just withered away uh, in these companies and, and were at very, very low production levels compared to what they could be at. And now we go into 2023 and we say, okay, these companies now have some money. They can go in and they can increase production out of their, their assets through some water flooding, through some polymer, uh, maybe switching to horizontal drilling on a field that was previously uh, exploited with, with the vertical wells. And there's a double whammy effect that comes out of that, where as you increase production, your operating cost per barrel comes down. So even at the same oil price, you might end up making $10, 15 $20 a barrel extra compared to what the company was making six months ago. And then you get the, obviously, the icing on the cake uh, or the cherry on the cake, which is the, uh, if, if WTI price rise with it, you now get a double effect uh, on that if the company can execute. And I think that's where, uh, I've said this before and I'll say it again, I think anybody who's got a engineering or, or geology uh, background, or if you've got somebody like that on your team, it really helps uh, find these, these, these diamonds in the rough and these gems. Uh, and, and I think White Tundra overall has been more and more that way. I know at the beginning you said, uh, 50% uh, uh, is what my bio reads into small cap junior growth companies. Uh, I would say we're now up to 60 to 75% in that uh, because that's just where I see the best uh, production growth potential, the best uh, financial leverage, the best uh, distressed valuation, and also the opportunity for just growth and being able to prove out a new technology with oil in the place. We, we always start with oil in the ground, OOIP, uh, original oil in place. That's what you want with the low recovery factor and then using new technologies that can bring that oil out. Um, so yeah, more, more of a venture capitalist model is what I've moved to here, shying away from the bigger uh, public companies who I think are, are, are fairly valued at today's price um, at this point in time. Thank you so much. I know we're coming up on the hour. We probably could talk about this for another two hours. But uh, before we conclude, uh, I want to go through uh, what I normally do. And, uh, you know, that's the same question for each of you. Kind of uh, talk about anything that we'll start with Abdul Aziz. Uh, but talk about anything that you want to talk about that you weren't able to discuss and or what should we really as investors be looking at, you know, over the next, you know, 12, 24, 36 months? Yeah, great question. There are a few points that I wanted to highlight from, of course, my colleagues' uh, discussion, especially regarding what is happening with refiners. You see, refiners... Yes, we've had a few capacity additions and then a few refineries closures, but this is extremely very, very geographic. What I mean to say is most of the capacity additions have happened east of Suez. Most of the closures happened west of Suez. What does that say? Well, it tells us that the real market for refined products, as well as crude, of course, would be eastward not West. And another point is, given the restrictions and the sanctioning and the price caps, all that is being uh, being exercised on, on Russia, this has caused a major, major reset of the global crude dynamics flows into the East markets. What would that cause? Well, it would cause to create new markets of competition, especially in Asia and Eastern Asia, as well as less competition and a recession westward. So having to look geographically at this is very critical. Another element regarding refiners, we have to be very fair with refiners. They have not only been... Um, not only have they been uh, trying to capitalize on what they have as capacity, but there is a major uh, rationalization process that has shifted the refinery output towards more and more naphtha chemicals, petrochemicals, instead of fuels uh, such as gasoline or, or gas oil or or diesel. So to be fair for refiners, yes, the crack spreads 
geographically are are going towards uh, towards jet fuel, especially in Asia, China in specific, but they don't give you the bigger picture that refineries are actually operating at maximum uh, capacity. Well, another thing that I wanted to highlight uh, is policy backlash. P poor policies that have been produced over the past what a uh, couple of years, let's say uh, 24 months, these will backlash. And it will take time until that hits the market and the consumer is affected. And it would, it would take a few incidents until people start to realize, oh, bad previous policies would cause uh, the consumer to ask for another major shift of regime in the overall policies. I'll leave it at that and I'll uh, let uh, Josh and Shabam address more. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. So, Josh, you're up next. Um, something you want to cover that we didn't cover yet. And then, you know, what should we as investors kind of look at, be looking at over the next couple of years? Sure. So um, I think I think the most interesting thing happening right now is that fundamentals are quite strong uh, while pricing is quite weak. And while that sort of generally led to more interesting equity opportunities, I think it's also highlighted or so opened up a whole set of sort of special situation opportunities. And so uh, yeah, I won't get into any sort of uh, specifics and isn't is an offer. I just think that um, there's so many interesting places to go when a sector goes out of favor, especially when the fundamentals are strong. And so um, you know, I just can't can't highlight that enough. I think I think the sector should do well. There's sort of this general trend of you know energy in the S and P. I think is at four percent to five percent, and there's a good argument it gets to ten or fifteen percent, which should offer some nice upside on the larger cap side. But I think the really exciting opportunities are on the smaller cap side, on off the run names, where there's just interesting aspects that people aren't looking for, aren't focusing on, and you know where there's really truly uh, undiscovered or poorly understood gems that are just sitting out there in plain sight. Excellent, thank you. That's good advice, I like it, I like it. Um, and then Shabam, you uh, up next. If you can cover anything that we didn't cover. If you wanted to, uh, if we missed something you wanted to talk about, and then kind of what should we be looking at, uh, you know, over the next couple of years as investors? Yeah, for sure. I think one of the big things, and I'm just going to kind of piggyback off what Josh is saying, is is there's this general. Uh, narrative or agreement that the oil bulls were wrong and then without, we're out here now we should exit the trade but but really in a structural supply a constrained market what what is going to constrain supply more than lower prices and what is going to increase demand more than lower prices so I think it's almost like a uh, as much as I don't like to use this term it's it's a self-fulfilling prophecy that that the longer oil prices stay down here uh, the higher run-up we have and the longer of a sustained run-up we have. I mean, we've taken a lot of bullets here. We've taken the SPR. We've taken the paper markets completely uh, unwinding. We've taken the fact that all this excess supply around the world that was kind of hiding has come out of the uh, the woodworks. Uh, we've taken every single government in the world trying to uh, uh, manipulate oil prices down to uh, with their job owning to the point that um, you know they can control inflation. Um, and we've seen the duck count come down. We've seen rigs ramp. There, there's been so many hits we've taken. And I think what I what I really like to get across, the point I like to get across, is is what's on the other side of that. What happens as we now look at a uh, supply demand uh, imbalance going forward, and then we don't have an SPR, or we see the Fed now trying to lower rates in order to spur the economy. Uh, there's really these these tailwinds that we end up getting that have been complete headwinds uh, so far. And and the same applies to really any factor that's worked against us. You look at something like a Russian production, for example. Yes, it's been very, very good thus far. But Russia was one of the countries that that could have added supply uh, three years ago. If we looked at it, that was one of the ones that we we would have pegged as, OK, if if prices do rise materially from here, this is a country that can add a million or two barrels over a two to five year period. Well, now, now that uh, possibility is off the table. So there's just more and more factors working with us. 
uh, moving forward. And, and I think that's the point I really want to get across is, is we're out here looking quite good. Yeah, price is where it is and price drives narrative. There's, there's a lot of explanations that have come out um, that have been, I think, completely wrong uh, as to why price has dropped. Uh, but I feel very comfortable here moving forward. I think this is a this is a cycle that's going to be uh, one of the longest cycles uh, thus far, similar to that 01 to uh, 2014 cycle, let's say, uh, moving forward. And uh, I think what what should be we as investors be watching for um, money money flows. I think the the companies will do what they're going to do. The companies are in very very good shape from a, a balance sheet perspective. Uh, the companies have the assets. Some of the small caps, as Josh mentioned, uh, are in this special situation as well. The price of oil today is just enough for them to make a decent amount of cash flow, put that back into their assets and do uh, what they're trying to do. But really, when you see that money come in into this sector, and uh, obviously we're all expecting cash flow valuations to return to what they did uh, in that 2010 to 14 era, uh, there's going to be a lot of interest in this sector. We're now in a in a very momentum-driven market uh, as much as we say that the uh, hedge funds and whatnot don't want to invest in oil, uh, there is always going to be interest to make some money. I think we're all in the stock markets here to make uh, uh, outsized returns, and that money is going to chase this this market when the time comes. Uh, and really, that's that's what I'm betting on, and I think that's what we're all betting on. And in the meantime, we just stay patient uh, and enjoy our life and uh, yeah, have these discussions so that everybody can uh, stay on board with the fundamentals and, and kind of share our... Uh, our things and have a back and forth um, as the cycle continues. I love it. Thank you. And um, please make sure to follow these guys on Twitter. They all post a lot of great information. Uh, follow Place Your Trades as well to find out the events coming up. I'm going to post a link right now on my Twitter stream. So don't forget to sign up for a free PDF for the key takeaways from today's discussion. And with that, I hope everybody has a great rest of your day. Thank you, gentlemen, for taking time out of your day for this discussion. I really appreciate it. I'm sure our listeners do as well. And, uh, and uh, well, I guess we'll see you next Wednesday. Thank you, everyone.